Well, I'm joined here at the Australian Music Vault by Patrick Donovan, the CEO of Music Victoria, a self-confessed music fan and a well-known name and face around the Melbourne music industry and undoubtedly Australian music industry too, thanks to your work with Music Victoria. Welcome. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, Jane. Nice to be here. 20 years ago, you started a column called Sticky Carpet, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But I wanted to ask you, what, what's your first memory and first experience of live music? Uh, my first uh, experience was the first two shows that my dad took me to were Elton John at uh, Festival Hall and um, the Bob Dylan Tom Petty show at the um, Kuyong. And then through Triple R and PBS and the Street Press, which was accessible to uh, people of all ages, uh, I just started discovering bands like uh, X and Blue Ruin, Painters and Dockers, Shower Scene from Psycho. They're all so out there and mm. so different and really unique. And um, fortunately, there were a few all ages shows around that time in the sort of mid 80s. So I got to start going to a couple of these bands and start to see some of these shows myself. And uh, I think the first CD I bought was. Uh, Santana double CD because you got more more value for money um, <laughs> if you bought a double CD. But you could also borrow CDs from a library in a place in uh, in Burke Street. So I remember getting the Cindy Lauper record. You know, um, people think I'm very rock and roll, but I grew up on a huge diet of of great pop music in the eighties. Um, one of the great eras for music. Mm, I agree. What did this? Um, you said you devoured the street press and and started going to gigs. What did this live music world represent to you at, at that young age? Uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was also the MTV era as well. So, um, you know, very colourful. Um, you know, it was a bit of a fantasy world, whether it was a Duran Duran video clips or something a bit seedier, like uh, maybe a, an X video clip. But the, <laughs> the Huda Gurus were a lot of fun. There was a lot of fun in this music and it was sort of a bit of a fantasy world that was really exciting. Certainly writers like Andrew Masterson, Philippa Hawke, who wrote in EG, uh, were very uh, vivid writers and they wrote uh, uh, beautifully about how music sort of influenced them. I'll never forget Andrew Masterson writing about playing the cramps, driving down the Great Ocean Road. <laughs> I thought, yep, that's pretty good. What was it struck, that struck you about that article? Uh, just, I just couldn't wait to get my driver's licence and <laughs> drive down the Great Ocean Road and, and, and experience it as well. Um, Later I ended up tour managing Iggy Pop and driving him around all around the Great Ocean Road and uh, I had certain albums that I played him and, uh, yeah, we really hit it off over a particular album. What so, um, yeah, driving, playing music and driving, hearing music uh, on transport, whether it's playing it in a car. Um, I love, uh, I got married on the blues train, C.W. Stone King played on the train on my uh, wedding. Um, I love seeing bands at, um, on the Murray, on those river boats. Um, yeah, music and travel's a big thing for me. So, Paddy, tell me how you got your start in the music industry, your foot in the door. Sure. Well, uh, after studying at university at uh, Monash, I um, started a band when I was there because you have that spare time when you're at uni and did a radio show, did a few articles for Street Press, but then I got a cadetship in 1995 at the Age newspaper. I did uh, the rounds for about three years, police rounds, um, business writing, um, everything that you can do there. And then I managed to get the music writing title um, uh, three years later. But I didn't want to just be writing entertainment stories, light entertainment. I wanted to be writing hard news up the front of the paper. So I was really uh, lucky to get, I think I was the first writer to get the music writer title oh. as a, as opposed, uh, like a medical writer or a court reporter. Uh, but my big break came with um, I got asked to tour manage uh, Iggy Pop and I wrote a, a big article about what I expected it to be like uh, based on the Please Kill Me books, Legs McNeil books and all of the old stories as opposed to what it really was like. So it was a big uh, feature in the Saturday Age about this maniac uh, <laughs> hanging out on the Great Ocean Road where all of the age readers were holidaying. Um, <laughs> and there was a nice juxtaposition there and I wrote that article and sort of um, got my chance through that. So I encourage and I always encourage any music writers to write an amazing piece of journalism. That's the way you get in. Um, <laughs> Although not so much these days now with uh, Facebook news. <laughs> not so much these days. But, uh, I mean, I you sort of got to force your way into the industry. So my story came that it was the first offshore festival and um, so I went to cover it for The Age at Torquay in 1997 and um, I really enjoyed it But um, and I left my lost my keys. They found my keys. Tim McGregor said, yep, come and get your keys. And they gave me the keys and I flicked them a tape, which was the uh, first Fu Manchu record in search of. And I said, um, if you're going to have a surf, rock, surf Coast Rock Festival, you need this band. 
and they all fell in love with this band and then they thought this guy's so passionate about this band, why don't we ask, ask him to tour manage Fu Manchu? And then when they pulled out, Tim felt so sorry for me, he said, oh, well, we can't, they've pulled out but how about doing Iggy Pop? So it was basically <laughs> from my passion for this music, losing my keys, flicking him a tape that basically led to my, uh, my landing in the music industry and uh, I called my son Iggy out of a uh, tribute to uh, him and, and, and that story. So 1998, you get the sticky carpet column in The Age, a very influential column, uh, one that's devoured again by, by music lovers all around the city. What did that do for you? Uh, it sort of opened me up a bit. Um, I refused to have my photo. Uh, I remember, you, you know how with, with, with the sort of uh, changes in newspapers at some stage, there'll be a phase of lifestyle writers and half the column space is a you know, waste-up shot of, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to be recognised when I was out especially I was being a critic and I was critiquing some of the music industry, but I also wanted to be a bit anonymous. So uh, I had to fight really hard at that stage um, and uh, Lunig agreed to draw me a caricature of a uh, rock and roll bar fly. And um, so that was a big moment for me that I got a Lunig man. I was anonymous, so I represented the people um, rather than me being some kind of, um, you know, uh, more important person uh, with better taste than everyone else. Uh, so I, I just wrote about my weekends. Um, I wrote about the experiences I had. I put some news in there. I really focused on Australian um, news and bands. Um, I was getting a bit fed up with multinational record labels telling us that this band is huge in the UK, so they will be huge here. I'd say, no, I don't like them. Good on you. Um, so I really focused on the Australian music and I went out and wrote about my weekends. Um, I didn't even know how many you know people read it at the time until a few years later um, people said, oh, well, they get the age and that's sort of, you know, if they're music fans, they read that sort of quite religiously. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I wrote in the third person. Sticky did this, Sticky did that. Bit <laughs> of a character. Someone wrote a book about Sticky Carpet and this um, flying carpet, uh, magic carpet. Uh, Matt Zerbo, I don't know if it ever got published, <laughs> but it became, you know, it would have been great animation actually. Mm. Um, so uh, I suppose I got closer to uh, a lot of the artists and I really did love seeing shows in small venues um, and that intimacy and getting to know some of the artists. It was a bit difficult that you came quite close to these artists. They say a proper critic can never be, be close to them. But um, I was generally supportive of people like, you know, um, you know, Spencer P. Jones and the Powder Monkeys and a lot of the bands around at the time in the 90s. Um, you know, if I didn't particularly like an album, I'd probably just review a, another album I liked. So, um, yeah, but <clears throat> some of them did have thin skin. <laughs> if you did give them an average review later on, uh, yeah, that was an interesting ex experience where, um, yeah, they all sort of turned and I was like, God, I've, I've given you probably 20% higher uh, marks than you've probably deserved for years. And uh, <laughs> But anyway, it was nice to know that they cared and it was important for the musicians um, that you did sort of cover their art. So it was a very exciting time. You know, rock was dying in 1998 when I started. Yeah, it was, um, yeah. It was, it was dying and... Um, and then through the Strokes and the Datsuns and the White Stripes um, uh, internationally, sort of put it back on the map and, um, and then things really followed on the major stage. But um, we always had, you know, the True Believers and the great rock and roll bands in Melbourne and they never, never went away. So what happened after Sticky Carpet? How long was that column and then how did, it, how did, how did you leapfrog to Music Victoria? Yeah, so I wrote um, Sticky Carpet for 12 years and um, the paper was thriving at the time so I didn't leave because of uh, any pressures like they have now with declining readerships and resources. Uh, I was covering the um, the whole series of events that led to the Slam Rally in 2010. So essentially leading up to a, an election, um, there was some alcohol fueled violence, a couple of cases around sort of King Street and uh, you know, strip clubs and then um, the government made a mistake and they basically did a, a blanket crackdown on any licensed venues, including live music venues, and they ended up linking <clears throat> violence to live music, which is quite offensive. So mm. uh, I was covering a lot of those stories and importantly the age were running them on page one and three, um, <clears throat> which is amazing. So they weren't buried in the mm. back of the book. Uh, and I got to know sort of quite a few people involved in the whole slam rally. There were so many sort of passionate people who got together for that. And um, so I, I was covering a lot of those issues. So I was aware of it. I had to, it was quite complex. I needed to know the ins and outs of what was happening. Uh, and then that was sort of ground zero for music activism in Victoria. Um, and what year was that? 2010. So that's, we give a lot of lectures at universities and, and we go out and say, right, you have to understand why this happened and why it will never happen again. So, um, yeah, so essentially I covered the Slam Rally, 20,000 people uh, marching down the streets and then everything changed after that. So the Labor government wrote an, an accord 
um, saying they'll repeal um, uh, some of those laws, and then um, the the state government, uh, the Labor, promised uh, some seeding funding for Music Victoria, and they had some plans to start um, for Music Victoria to roll out some government programs of investment, and then I went for the job, um, and um, they gave it to me. And I suppose we always say that. We're not a bunch of bureaucrats sitting in an office in a suit. We're we're um, we're in the mosh pit. Mm. We all play in bands, and I think that's probably why they hired me because they wanted someone who was very passionate. Certainly, a lot of the work I did at the age, the age didn't necessarily rate it uh, <laughs> outside right by writing, which I was fair enough. I was employed to do, but <clears throat> I did start the campaign for Ace at SE Lane. I started the AGG Awards, which turned into the Age Music Victoria Awards. Um, I was very wrote very passionately about celebrating what we had um, in Victoria in particular. So I think they thought I had that side covered and um, we had a really strong board. I've been mentored <clears throat> in uh, running business over the seven years, um, but quite a lot of what I was doing transferred quite well to, to the new job and I've been in it for seven years. The AGG Awards, uh, uh, Patty, that's that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. The slam really covering that and, and, and being the uh, agent of change, I guess, for ACDC Lane. As well, and, yeah. the, and the slam rally. This is big stuff. You, you you gloss over it very quickly, but this is huge stuff, especially in Melbourne, to change the face of, of the live music scene here. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice that you say that. And you know, today's one of the first times I've sort of thought, okay, well, I'm coming up to twenty years, and you know, we're starting to sort of uh, lock a few things in and um, a few runs on the board. But um, I suppose I just feel so sorry for musicians how little they get paid, um, and uh, you know that they should have more respect. So that's sort of my cause. That's a great cause. How hard is it to get a street name named after a band <laughs> Look, in the city of Melbourne? It's a good story. I mean, I, I uh, when, you, when you explain how, the, how these things happen, it's all pretty funny and random. And um, so uh, I was pretty uh, determined. Um, I was a bit annoyed that the sports people got fettered so much and certainly the ticker tape parades. I think the government spends a million dollars per gold medal uh, and all statues around um, Margaret Court Arena and Rod Laver Arena. So I wrote in my column that it's time that the musicians got um, some of this credit as well, suggested ACDC, our greatest music export would be a good example. It was fairly frivolous. I said, you know, Hume Highway, you know, Highway to Hell, um, suggested a whole bunch of things, knew that statues cost $100,000 and then um, thought, I wonder about um, street signs. So um, I don't think we had any music street um, uh, street signs at that time. I just called up the City of Melbourne um, and asked reception. I said, I want to ask someone about street signs. And they said, I'll put you through to this person, uh, Tom Parker. And then this person, Tom Parker, picked up the phone. And I said, oh, is that Tom Parker from my old band, Cow's Muff, who I haven't seen in 10 years? He said, yes. <laughs> and um, so he said, oh, no, it only costs the, the cost of the sign. You need to actually do a petition or you need to actually... Um, write a letter to the council, um, calling them for to um, you know pay tribute to an act, and and then it'll go through the the motions and um, and the, the whole process of um, putting it out to for public uh, feedback and the like. <clears throat> and so yeah, I wrote the column. Um, I don't know how many people read it, but Marty Bolton, who wrote for the Age as well, City Reporter, was doing a doorstop with Mary Dalahunty, and then said at the end of the interview, oh, what do you think about this idea? And she said, oh, yeah, I quite like that. So the ball got rolling. And um, <clears throat> then it was quite entertaining because they um, they put it out for public feedback and then the articles, the the, 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 the the content I was getting, you know, I must have written 20 stories out of it. You know, the Swedes said, yes, you must do this. The Christian groups were saying, no, Satan, you know, <laughs> is still alive. Satan will be resurrected. <laughs> Rosati's. Um, Basically opposed it. Um, it's a rag trade area, so uh, Rosati's actually opposed it. They thought they thought of ACDC fans as sort of these crazy hell raisers from the eighties, <laughs> low lives, and also you know the ACDC, the bisexual thing. It's incredible what some people thought Honestly. about ACDC represented, and we kept on saying, no, they're all you know all those fans are all got families now and probably in bed by nine o'clock. <laughs> um, so it was very interesting. We got a lot of copy out of it. We got to the stage where the Age news editor said, we can't keep writing these stories, is it going to happen? And we just sort of said, yes, it will happen. Um, and then they, the council um, had a bit of a backlash to it actually being um, in that area where ACDC Lane is at the top end of sort of Flinders Lane. Uh, 101 Collins Street opposed it. Um, so it was quite interesting, the backlash and the support. It was a fantastic debate, great copy for stories. And then eventually they uh, 
suggested a compromise that um, they couldn't actually do it in Corporation Lane where Cherry Barra was because we really thought that you needed to be able to, if tourists were going to come, they needed to take the photo in front of the sign and then go and hear some Aussie rock and roll. Mm. And that's where Cherry Barra was, run by Bill Walsh at the time. And so they came up with a comp suggested a compromise that um, the laneway behind the old brashes in Elizabeth Street could be named ACDC Lane. <laughs> and we just said, you know what, don't worry about that. We, don't worry about it. You know, we need, we need it to be where people are actually going to visit. And then so we sort of gambled, rolled the dice, and um, they ended up saying, okay, well, well fair enough. Um, you can have it there in ACDC, in, in, in the old corporate lane, corporation lane. And it's one of the most visited spots in, um, in Melbourne now. It is, Some, yeah. James Young runs it now and there's some fantastic artwork there. ACDC don't do interviews um, when they come to Melbourne, so when they do their shows here, all the TV cameras come down to ACDC Lane. <laughs> it's the spiritual home. And then James has subsequently bought um, uh, uh, photos and diaries of Irene Bond's ex-wife. Um, so he's sort of got a lot of it's become a bit of a sort of tomb to ACDC. And one of my favourite moments was the day before um, the sign went up and... Um, Kept on hearing rumours that Bon Scott's son lived in Melbourne and worked at a bookstore, Metropolis, in St Kilda. And I just thought, well, if he is around, all his Bon's mates are coming tomorrow, so he should be there. And so I just called up Metropolis and someone answered and I said, um, oh, sounds a bit weird, but I'm looking for Bon Scott's son. And I was like, the scene out of Star Wars, he said, I am Bon Scott's son. <laughs> and then we thought, oh, maybe he's bullshitting, you know. Um, and then he said he'll come down. And we were standing there with some of Bon's mates and this guy about sort of five foot ten, you know, uh, brown eyes, wispy brown hair, um, started walking down the laneway and everyone's just gone, that's him. So it was never doubted. And then um, he was quite shy about it, um, Dave Stevens. Mm. Um, but uh, two weeks ago for Bond's what would have been 71st birthday, he got up and sang Jailbreak, <laughs> Jailbreak which ACDC never play because it's too Bond. So he got up and he's now embracing it. Being yeah, son it's taken him a while to embrace. Yeah. I think he was disbelieved by so many people because as far as the story I know is that Bon had a relationship with perhaps an underage fan and uh, Dave is the result of that. So I think there's been a little little bit of maybe uh, coloured history there perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what, yeah. I mean, what, what would have been the greatest story of my lifetime? Well, Dave always said that he was going to give me the story when he's ready to come out. I wasn't a journalist then. So he <laughs> did it with a guy, Steve Butler, over in Perth, which is a really good yarn. But, you know, there is a lot of uh, suggestion that Bon Scott did write a lot of the lyrics for Back in Black and he's not credited for it. Yes, and I have when, heard that. When, when Dave's record store was going down, Pure Pop, you know, he could have done with a few bucks. Mm. And I thought, wow, gee, that would be an interesting story if they uh, could prove that Bon actually wrote some of those lyrics, one of the mm. highest-selling albums of all time. Mm. That would have paid for a, a whole new record store and, and then some. But yeah. um, I think it's just great that he's feeling more comfortable in his own skin and... Uh, you know, he, uh, he he did really well the other night and got up in front of the fans and, and belted it out. So so that was really exciting. So I suppose the <clears throat> moral of some of these stories is random things happened, you know. Yeah, certainly I th Melbourne. I threw, a, I threw a tape to Tim McGregor from the Falls and um, ended up, you know, looking after Iggy Pop and writing a story about it, getting the music writing job, which led to so much, the award, Sticky Carpet. And then um, in terms of uh, the Bon Scott thing and the ACDC Lane, I called up the council and... A guy who I used to play in a band with answered the phone and, um, yeah. Like so, happens. <laughs> so I encourage young people in the music industry to uh, to don't be shy and get up and, and, and have a crack. And now there's so many graduates coming through all these music um, business courses that we didn't have back in the day and the great thing is they're learning about uh, some of these stories and we're passing on some of these stories and uh, particularly with uh, galvanising the industry through the slam rally and um, standing up for what you believe in. What a turning point uh, in, a, in uh, Australia's, like, music history. Mm. Um, uh, there's, Chris, there's Chrissy Amphlett Lane now, isn't there? Yeah. Any more plans, do you think, to uh, um, get any more street So moves? Chrissy Amphlett Lane's fantastic. Roland S. Howard Lane in St Kilda. That's right, yes. And there's, this, um, there's grants through the state government at the moment to apply for some uh, <clears throat> artistic creation in those laneways. So um, there's murals happening. There's some interesting stuff happening in ACDC Lane. There's going to be, like, a hand solo statue of Bon Scott, like when he's frozen in time. <laughs> so, um, you know, it'd be great. It's great that there'll be more murals and more artworks and performances in the existing lanes. There's a Paul Hester Way, which I visited on the weekend. Um, and we, um, you know, we, 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 we actually want to do a survey um, 
th with some of the newspapers, possibly through the vault as well, asking the people who should mm. get the next laneways. That's Because you great shouldn't idea. just have connected people to yeah. council or really passionate people. Like yeah. it should be a bit more democratic. A bit more open. Yeah. So um, we've been talking about doing a poll with one of the papers and asking the public mm. who should get the next. Um... I always thought Paul Kelly should be a contender. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about some of your mm. Music Victoria achievements post Slam, because at the moment, you know, oh, well. Just for, just off the top of my head, there's gender diversity that you've been uh, combating, uh, the the decline and then the rise and then the decline of all ages gigs in, in, in the mm. state, violence and live music, which has reared its head in the last five mm. years, which we never really, I mean, it may have always been there, but it certainly wasn't an issue at the forefront. Mm. Uh, so do you want to just tell me about some of those things that you've been dealing with? Yeah, certainly the big one which Victoria is famous for is the agent of change laws. So the agent of change law is planning law that protects existing venues from new developments and new neighbours coming in and complaining and one person shutting down a venue. Um, which which was the which was the go yeah, back in the day. Yeah. You know, an apartment block got built, someone mm. complained and there you go, there's there's a you know, 30, 40 year old uh, pub being shut down on the basis of one person can't sleep. Yeah, it's un Australian. <laughs> and that's <laughs> totally how we is. that's how we got it over the line. You know, politicians <laughs> of all persuasions. You know, who was here first, you know? Any Australian rocks up to a picnic table or a picnic or a gig or anything, you know, respect to who was there first. Mm. Uh, so agent of change had been thrown around for a while. Um, our former chairman, Ashley Admiral, came up with the term. He was working for the planning department in 2003 when John Perring from Fair Go for Live Music um, uh, encouraged Mary Delahunty, the arts minister at the time, to um, endorse their, the ta their ta live music task force recommendations and it included the agent of change. Now, unfortunately, um, they only um, brought it in as a practice note. So it was, it was advice. It was, it was voluntary. You know, developers and councils right. and VCAT could take it into account. If they wanted to, which they probably if they wanted to. <laughs> so we had 10 years that it just had no legislative teeth and it just didn't work. Then once Miss Victoria started, I got contacted by the person who invented the term agent of change, Ashley Admiral, came to visit me and said we, uh, it wasn't done right the first time. He was working for the government at the time. Now he wanted to come and work for the other side. Mm. So they're the calls that you want to get. So, And he said there was no peak body at the time. There was no non-for-profit independent organisation representing the venues that the government could deal with. So um, he came in and advised us on this. And then Nick Tweedy, who's um, senior counsel, barrister, uh, musician, big music fan, um, he came in and worked with us as well and the Slam crew and they go for live music. So we had a good little team. Uh, when the coalition won the election um, uh, in 2012, uh, they promised to set up a live music roundtable and um, also pass some legislation recognising the contribution of live music into the Liquor Act and that's it. And we thought, oh, well, how far is that going to go? But it ended up going a long way. So liquor licensing suddenly had this, um, this object that um, apart from alcohol uh, fueled, uh, reducing alcohol fueled uh, violence, um, suddenly respecting live music was in their constitution basically. And um, they also set up this round table. So the round table was fantastic because it actually had a terms of reference pointing to a minister that had to act on the recommendations and it was run by liquor licensing and we uh, it had music industry representatives. So we could actually get some business done, get some deals done with the government there. So we actually achieved a lot with the coalition government they deregulated all ages gigs. They um, did exemptions for um, the building code because a lot of venues were uncompliant. And um, then they brought in the agent of change just before the election. So um, they suggested initially that they would make it voluntary. So we thought, oh, great, we've lobbied for so many years for the agent mm -hmm. of change. And now we're going to have to start a campaign to get every council to take it on. And um, so we pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and certainly slam having that 20,000 people database. <laughs> so it was a bit good cop, bad cop. We worked with the government and they did a bit of yelling when needed needed to be. And so we thought we've got one crack at this, we have to get it right. So um, it was very interesting and I could write a book about it one day about how it all went down right to the wire uh, around the election time and how Slam were frozen out of the negotiations because um, they'd been, been a bit rude. Um, so <laughs> it was very interesting. But uh, needless to say, I suddenly had to become not an expert but... I had to um, have a pretty good understanding of planning law, liquor licensing law, okay. building codes, all of that, which wasn't what I expected when I signed up for the job, but, <laughs> hey, someone's going to do it. Do you find it easy or hard or challenging to speak to politicians who are just not on a musical wavelength? Uh, no, no, it's one of my skills, I think. Um, 
the fortunate um, situation we have is generational change. So um, most of the politicians who we deal with are, you know, Gen, Gen X. So they're in their 40s or 50s and most of them went to university and on Friday and Thursday and Friday nights, they went and saw bands, that's what they did. So it's no longer the baby boomers who were into music or, or they weren't counterculture or, or not. Um, very much people, everyone likes live music and it's really helped. So there's a lot of evidence in the past of music peak bodies getting funded by Labor and then when Labor got kicked out, the money goes. They had no relationship with the coalition. Mm. So um, we're one of the first peak bodies, certainly in Victoria, to actually have this great relationship with both sides of government. So the coalition, um, you know, reformed all these laws um, that we suggested. Everything we put up in the agenda for the um, Live Music Roundtable, pretty much the coalition government did. And then they lost the election and then Labor came in with $25 million, including paying for this vault. <laughs> so uh, it's been an interesting ride, um, but it's very important for us that we have all sides of politics supporting music and understanding the role of live music. And st soon after the um, uh, after the slam rally, um, Arts Victoria at the time commissioned a really good report into the economic, cultural and social contribution of live music. And so we finally had some statistics and the great statistic, which was more people attend live music than uh, attend the AFL. Is that right? Is yes. that a true fact? Yes. The AFL and um, soccer and rugby, the whole lot. So our problem was that um, <clears throat> Live Performance Australia had some annual report about the big ticket items, um, but we didn't have any stats on the small to medium-sized venues, which we all love so much, you mm. know, as Paul Kelly calls the university mm -hmm. uh, for musicians. So we had no stats around that. <clears throat> and I describe it as... You know, you'll see 80,000 people en masse walking to the MCG for a football game, mm. but you don't see the hundreds of thousands of people going to see music in small venues because <clears throat> they're walking down the streets and then they'll just peel off into laneways and doorways mm. and up stairwells and, you know, there's 200 of them at, at a time, but there's, you know, that's happening 100 Constantly, times on every yeah. night. So we actually had those statistics and that was very, very important for lobbying. Um, and then we did our own live music census and we did a regional census. So once we had the economic statistics about the contribution of live music in the region, suddenly we started getting councils to write music strategies and start taking it more seriously. And you need those economic figures. So if we can say to Geelong Council, well, if you actually don't have venues for King Gizzard and the like to play at or fans to experience music at, they'll just go up the road to Melbourne and this will cost you this much. <laughs> and then they come on board and then one, one does, then another one has to. So we've been playing, we've had this sort of, this strategy where we actually work with limited resources. We try and change laws to impact on as many people as possible in the state, but then you have to work at that micro level as well. So mm. we do that through councils and we've now got a number of councils writing music strategies um, to work to support their local communities. My goodness. Now, the violence and live music issue that's raised been raised in the last couple of years, yeah. um, well, what are your thoughts on that? And, I mean, there's obviously plans in place to change the culture of violence and sexual harassment at live music venues? Yeah. Um, so I sit on the Liquor Control Advisory Council representing the music industry, so I see all of the statistics and certainly I have children. I certainly don't want to see anyone, um, you know, attacked out in, out in the streets. Mm. Um, there's absolutely zero statistics linking violence to live music for starters and that was made very clear around the time of the Slam Rally. And they, they just won't even go back there in Victoria. It's just like, forget about it. It's just right. sort of, um, there's no, there's no, um, there's, there's no, absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And the, the great line, which I think Quincy McLean said, was when you're facing the stage, you don't face off. People <laughs> are buying a ticket to see a show mm. and they drink less because mm. you want to save your spot. Um, and that's why venues need to stay open till three o'clock because people aren't drinking that much while the bands are playing and then they want to talk about the gig afterwards and have a drink. Um, so uh, we actually, you know, there's actually evidence that, you know, music, particularly in the regions, um, young people going to see music and playing music and going to festivals actually reduces violence and certainly reduces um, people taking ice, you know, through boredom. So, you know, if you're particularly in the country and you're not into sport, what are you going to do? So it's so important to have opportunities for, mm. for young people to, to perform and not be bored and to interact with culture and express themselves. Um, Sydney, um, Sydney had its crisis a couple of years ago. It was the equivalent to our slam crisis. But unfortunately, there, wasn't, there weren't 20,000 people who marched the streets. No, there wasn't. They just weren't passionate like that. Yeah. There was no one to galvanise them. Tyson Coe's doing some good work up there. But, um, you know, they just don't have the volunteers like we had with Quincy and Helen from Slam and 
John Perring and, you know, we've got uh, Kate Shaw, we've, we've got, there's a team of sort of 10 mm. who have been involved in a lot of this um, and Kate Shaw goes back to saving the ESP um, a long time ago and she's a, a Doctor of Geography at Melbourne University. Um, we have some extremely passionate people and that's why I never expect any kudos for any of this because I get paid for most of it. Um, <laughs> a lot of these people don't get paid for it. So um, basically in Sydney that was a problem. It hit them pretty quickly yep. um, where um, anyone in the, any venue in the inner city, you know, there were going to be lockouts. I mean, it's not the end of the world up there. I mean, I if you get into Frankie's by 1.30, <laughs> you're set. You know, you just get there by 1.30. It's, it's not the end of the world. I went and spoke uh, about nighttime economies at the Electro Electronic Music Conference last year and um, I turned up and said, I had the great, best night I've had in Sydney for years. What are you <laughs> complaining about? Um, but now they're sort of getting exemptions um, from the lockouts. Um, Brisbane, um, they're going to be lockouts in Queensland mm. as well, but mm. now um, they've just limited it to photo scanners. So there are compromises, but, you know, you need music industry representatives on those government boards um, to basically have a voice. And previously there wasn't a voice for the music industry. But um, you know, we, we, pres we published the uh, Victoria's Live Music 10-point plan in March, which is considered sort of um, world best practice. And we um, successfully bidded for a global music convention to come here in April where we're going to share that plan and we're actually going to um, advise and consult uh, a number of cities from around the world who have contacted us, um, from Amsterdam, London, Bangkok. Um, so they're all going to come in and we're going to actually train them up in how to be a great music city. Patrick, you say you get paid for this and you're not super proud of your achievements, but this is massive. This really is massive. I mean, is there some point... I'm listening to you and and the changes you put in place and it's, I mean, apart from it being mind-blowing, is there is there not one one place where you go, uh, you take a moment, you go, heck, I did this? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's incredible. At some point. Uh, you know, I've got three kids. I'm taking my son to Queensland Stone Age tonight, 11-year-old. I just want them to have great opportunities like we did and for generations to continue. I mean, ACDC Lane will be there forever. Um, you know, we want uh, to set this up for, for, you know, decades to come. And it's very interesting, generations to come to benefit from it. Um, there's still more work to be done. It's never all going to be. What's the next challenge? We want to get music on TV, that's for sure. I don't know what the hell the ABC is doing. <laughs> um, that's a big one. We need music on, on, you know, Australian music, more Australian music on, on, um, on ABC and on TV. And Rage is on about four or five nights a week at the moment. I mean, I just think, you know, surely they can have a bit of analysis and mm. some interviews and Q&As as part of Rage. I mean, mm. that's the brand. Uh, I, it's Costs interesting nothing. that you bring this up uh, the week of the 30th anniversary of uh, Countdown's demise. This was, this was the week that uh, Countdown got taken off air wow. uh, 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so uh, interesting. Um, and also the fact uh, we have we have sport as you said sport you know sport is uh, revered so much in this country <clears throat> we have sports wrap up shows your sports tonight and your mm. sports updates well where's the music tonight or music this week yeah. you know wh where is it <laughs> well it could start in small phases because um, during the Commonwealth Games you know <clears throat> everyone's being very parochial about Australia why don't they have Australian music um, mm. in the cut-in and cut-outs of the ads and, and background music? So, That's right, yeah. So there are small steps and we've had a few conversations and we've yeah. been part of those meetings about how we can get the appropriate music onto commercial media mm. and, um, and and how the APC can support music a bit more. Um, certainly we've been pushing very hard for tourism to take music a lot more seriously. Um, you know, you pick up the in-flight magazine, um, Qantas magazine, and there's full-page ads taken out by the Austin Council from Texas saying, come over to Austin to see our music scene. Um, it's insane. So we want to brand up, you know, particularly the Melbourne Music City mm -hmm. idea. And um, and we're sort of on the global map now, particularly with this conference, and Absolutely. we really want Tourism Victoria, and they've been more supportive, but we really want live music to be one of the pillars, you know. Mm -hmm. um, penguins, all well and good, but... Um, uh, what yeah. what can you get in Victoria that you can't get in most cities in the world? And that's, you know, seeing any type of music any night of the week. Um, and the vault is going to be really pivotal in that as well. <clears throat> so that's going to you know, educate people about the history of music in, in Australia and then they can go and see all the live music and um, there's the laneways. So we're sort of building up these exciting things that people can do, you know, come, come to Melbourne and sort of have the music experience and then go to the regions and go to the festivals and the like. So tourism... You know, there are other areas of government that haven't quite jumped on the music I'm bandwagon. I'm sure you'll uh, be in their faces, Patrick. There's a few next. <laughs> Education's really important. So we have so many music courses now mm. and all these great graduates coming up and there's not enough work for them. So we're 
talking to the government about maybe paid internships to try and get them in there. But we need to create more jobs. You know, we need, um, you know, uh, the best entrepreneurs and small businesses to be supported, to grow. Um, we need to build infrastructure in the regions as well so people can move to the regions and actually, you know, have a career out there. Um, so there's still quite a bit to do. But audience development is very big and jobs is very big. So how do we get a bigger audience? How do we basically get those sort of fair weather music fans to actually mm -hmm. make sure they go and see an Australian band like they might, you know, like the film industry encourages them to see one Australian film a year. How do we get them to be aware of how great our and world class our music is and uh, mainstream media's got a, a big role to play there. So um, it's trying to understand the, um, the needs um, of all the stakeholders, you know, what, what, what's community radio looking for? What are the government looking for? What's the education department looking for? So um, it's building bigger audiences and it's creating more jobs to give opportunities for, um, you know, all the best acts. But, you know, there's part-time bands that just want to do it. There's serious career acts that deserve to uh, get the leg up to mm. make it overseas like Courtney has. Mm. So um, there's a whole range of musicians and reasons why people get into it and that's part of the fun. Let's talk about gender diversity in the Australian music industry. Are women fairly represented? When Music Victoria looked at the gender diversity issue two years ago uh, and surveyed the music industry, the answer was clearly no. A lot of it was lack of confidence, lack of opportunities. Um, there are a lot of issues there that we started sort of looking at. So uh, we set up a, uh, uh, a Women in Music Advisory Committee and um, we, we had a number of meetings and um, we developed uh, um, a number of initiatives. So we did some uh, workshops around, around confidence, confidence for women. Um, we also um, got some interesting statistics around the barriers to entry in the music industry. Um, so uh, Music Victoria immediately agreed to um, bring in quotas. So that's a big part of it. And I really think quotas are important and they work. So half of our board are female. Um, we have a, a minimum of 40% female on all of our um, panels um, and committees and, and everything we do now. So it's been really important. And it's had a great, great influence on the organisation. Um, we, I've found that it's had a, a, an impact, some of the work we've done and it's been, and, and a lot of bands have done some really interesting things as well, but it's really starting to have a generational uh, sort of uh, behavioural change. Um, uh, we see that the women in music at the moment, the, the revolution is just incredible. So bands like um, Camp Cope last year, mm -hmm. Tash Sultana, but some of the rock and roll bands like Miss Destiny, um, Cable Ties, um, Wet Lips, They've been putting out these amazing albums, so I think it might be the strongest time for women in rock and roll, in particular since the rock and roll high school days um, about twenty years ago. Mm. Um, so that's really very exciting. Um, so and then on the other side, you've got Sia and Courtney Barnett uh, making it internationally. Yeah, absolutely. So it's sort of the face of of, of Australian music. Mm. So on top of that, we um, spoke to a number of women who um, who talked about um, her being harassed and even assaulted in the music industry. And they basically just said, you guys wouldn't know it. It's very easy for guys mm. to say, I've never seen any violence. And we did say that, you know, uh, at the time of the slam rally, we've never seen a fight at a gig. Yeah, but, but sexual behind harassment the scenes, is, completely, is a completely different issue. Yeah, and you're talking about dark rooms, you're talking about, you know, people having quite a few drinks and close, close quarters. And we just started hearing these stories, you know, mm. horrific um, stats. And I've seen more general stats about and five women being assaulted mm. in their lives. It's horrific. So um, we, um, uh, Helen Marku, who's just a genius at getting government to do things, um, <laughs> she, um, uh, Jane Garrett was the Minister for Liquor Licensing at the time, who was a big music supporter, and she um, agreed to set up a task force into sexual assault and harassment. And um, then um, uh, the government committed $200,000 to run uh, a training pilot. So there'll be a campaign and a training for nine venues to train their staff um, to properly deal with this, um, which has been really, really good. And just last week, the corner said that they found um, there's been quite a, uh, quite a bit of, jet, um, of behavioural change from their punters. Wow. And then, so that was just for venues mm. in Victoria. And there are obviously issues with festivals. And we were saying 18 months ago, you've got to roll something out before the festival season. Mm. Um, and But they're quite different, you know, gigs, festivals, people are camping out and the like. Um, so the promoters have got together and last week launched Your Choice, which is this fantastic um, campaign, which is around um, uh, people being responsible and accountable for their own behaviour at festivals. So it's really about sort of calling people out, looking out for each other. Um, festivals only have the ability um, to, you know, they have a liquor licence to make mm. sure people aren't under 18, aren't 
drinking mm. um, and 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 getting drunk over 18, but they don't have the uh, resources or the tools to actually uh, test people for drugs, mm. um, do drug testing, um, really um, look after, get in, in, you know, force the people to look after each other and themselves. So some of these issues with the stampede at the falls and uh, sexual assault and uh, with their being sniffer dogs and people swallowing all their drugs, which is very dangerous for them. So there's a lot of issues around, mm. um, particularly happening at festivals. And a lot of it needed to be taken, uh, uh, the people needed to take charge and responsibility. So it's a brilliant um, campaign and I think it's going to have a really important um, impact on the way people behave at festivals. Um, I yeah. have to say it was great going to the Corner Hotel last week and going to the bathroom and saying this venue does not tolerate mm. any antisocial behaviour of yeah. any sort. If you see any, please uh, report it to, to the bar staff. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's quite a moment when... When you see stuff like that mm. and almost comforting and reassuring. Yeah, absolutely. We also, we did a Venues Day, ran a Venues Day yesterday and we had Arts, Arts Access coming and um, uh, telling the venues and there's a chapter in our best practice guidelines for venues about making your venues more friendly for disabled people. And um, so we had a disabled person explaining how, you know, this was the first time they could go to the Corner Beer Garden, um, Rooftop Garden, because there's a lift there and telling her all of her experiences and stories. Um, so there's work going on in that area and um, there's also uh, Bandmates, which is a program where um, volunteers can take uh, disabled people to concerts I've and there's another this. program where you can take refugees to concerts. So, you know, music industry really leads the way in a lot of these areas. And I just say to anyone who uh, thinks it's all being a bit sort of overly politically correct, I say, well, um, it is going to be good for your business because if you're providing a safe space for women, there are fifty percent of music fans are women. <laughs> you'll do good business, um, you know. And then disabled people. Apparently, one in five people have a disability, and so that's you know, mm. if you're just purely it's capitalist yeah. terms, you know, um, be as inclusive as possible. But we want everyone to have access to play music, <clears throat> to attend music, mm. to experience music, um, and we need the venues to be safe for the female musicians most importantly, and um, so they can play in a safe environment and are encouraged to play because if they have a bad experience, they'll give up and it's mm. bad, terrible for participation. And then the music fans need to be able to enjoy it in, a, in the best environment. And we're talking about audience development and as many people playing music as possible, That's mm. it's really important for it to be safe and, and accessible to, to all. With your work with the Australian Music Network, which is the peak body that overlooks all the other bodies of uh, the music bodies, bodies yeah. in Australia, what kind of feedback do you get from the other states? What what are the, their challenges, or what are their what are their uh, positive uh, points as far as the music industry and the way they run things? What 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 kind of feedback? Yeah, do you get? well, um, I mean, we often say that Melbourne is uh, the musicians' city because when uh, all nine shortlisted acts for the Australian Music Prize last year live in Victoria. <laughs> They couldn't really argue with that one. Um, but we said they're not from here, you know. They're from West Australia. They're from, you know, Paul Kelly's from South Australia. The drones are from um, uh, West Australia. Sorry, sorry, Paul Kelly's South Australia. The drones are West Australia. Blake from Peep Temple's West Australia. Courtney's Tassie in New South Wales. You know, we don't claim that, you know, we're born into this. Um, we but they claim, choose to live. We claim that we have the highest number of venues per capita in the world and we have amazing ecosystem which includes passionate volunteers, amazing media, community radio, record stores, boutique labels. So that ecosystem has basically created this incredible environment for musicians to move here. Um, so, you know, we acknowledge that, that um, a lot of these artists are from your great cities, but people are moving here for a reason so they can actually support their careers. Mm -hmm. Every state or territory does something incredible. I mean, Northern Territory has incredible um, Indigenous programs, um, Bush Divas, um, mentoring programs, um, you know, incredible desert reggae scene. Um, South Australia doesn't have a lot of infrastructure um, in terms of uh, managers and promoters, but they have a music development office, a music hub. They've got some really progressive um, ideas there. And the Stigwood Foundation, um, which hands out a lot of grants. Um, every state's got something incredible. Um, in a way, New South Wales was so dominant in the 80s that um, they sort of rested on their laurels a bit. So they've got a bit of work to sort of catch up to, a bit like London at the moment. So every state has got some um, area of strength and unique point of difference and big sound in, in Brisbane mm. and, um, and, you know, punk started worldwide, punk starting in Brisbane. So we work really closely together. 
um, you know, sometimes we might appear that we're being competitive. Um, <laughs> partly that's to sort of get our governments to realise that, you know, they've really got to get behind what we've got here and use it as a sort of tourism tool. But um, we all work very, very closely. Um, there are national bodies like Sounds Australia uh, that run the export initiative. Uh, no one overseas cares what state or city anyone's from. You're just Australian and that's that. So that's a united front. The National Live Music Office is looking at all of the um, uh, regulatory change um, around the country and trying to bring it all up to national uh, best practice. So we're all helping each other out with a number of these sort of initiatives. Um, and then we all sort of get together, you know, at a couple of conferences each year and work out how what we're going to present to the federal government. Wow. So we developed a contemporary music plan last year. Um, oh, sorry, two years ago for the state, uh, sorry, for the federal election. And we got some money for Sounds Australia, but not a lot else. So we're working on that, <clears throat> on developing that. And, you know, it doesn't all have to come out of the arts. You know, mm. we want to be sort of linked into education and innovation and tourism and small business. Mm. And, um, and, you know, we certainly persuaded the state government in Victoria that, you know, governments have to work holistically, you know, um, with the music industry because we benefit so many different areas and that hasn't quite got through at a, at a federal level. So that's what we're sort of working on leading up to the next election. A few more questions. <clears throat> the Australian Music Vault, what do you think it will bring to Australian music? How important is it to the Australian yeah, music scene? Yeah, I think scene? it's hugely important. I think it sort of anchors everything that's been going on. People have been calling for a Hall of Fame for many, many years. I think there's positives that it's taken this long to actually set it up <laughs> because other Hall of Fames for music have failed around the world. Other Hall of Sporting Hall of Fames have, have failed if they're not in the right spot and run by the right people. So this is absolutely run by the right people. They're the experts here at the Arts Centre Melbourne. And we've got a fantastic, um, diverse uh, advisory panel. And um, I'm very excited that it is going to be very, um, it's going to be appeal to all generations. Um, you know, we, we don't just, you know, you don't just want to have baby boomer artefacts. You know, it needs to be digital, interactive. You know, there are so many young people obsessed with music in this state um, and around Australia and you need them to come and you need to have basically revolving exhibitions and you need to have bands that they are aware of and then link it back to the past. So through a series of talks and family trees, I'm really excited that, um, you know, some of the heroes of music today will be able to actually pay tribute to, um, you know, some of the bands that um, influence them. I mean, if we think about... Uh, like Kim Salmon and how much he influenced the drones and mm. how much the drones are now influencing all of the bands coming out at the moment. If you think about Roland S. Howard's influence as a guitarist um, and it's a Melbourne sound now and this tribute to him with the laneway, but how do we get uh, young people to learn more about his influence? Well, that's because, you know, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and Mick Harvey donated so much of their stuff here to the archives. So people are going to be able to learn, be educated, I get very annoyed that um, classical music is taught at all the primary schools and um, it puts people off music. Mm. It puts a lot of people off music, put me off music. Um, classical music and opera. I just, um, you know, young people want to engage with Australian stories written by contemporary artists and um, I'm very excited about busloads of, music, of, of students coming in and learning about our contemporary music history, which is really, really what counts. Um, I'm also excited about the um, City of Melbourne Tourism Office is being moved to just outside Hamer Hall here. So this will be one of the first protocols for all the tourists to come in <clears throat> and they'll be shown, you know, uh, the Melbourne Music City app. This is where all the gigs are, a bit of history. Start your whole tour of Melbourne through here in the vault. <laughs> and, um, I think the little old ladies and the uh, Asian tourists will be here. <laughs> well, I think so. <laughs> Look, that's one of the big things we need to look at here we are investigating is there's 180,000 um, Asian international students living in Melbourne understanding their needs, um, how they can interact better with our music um, mm. and um, slowly sort of um, educate them about, you know, uh, uh, Australia's um, fantastic music as well. Um, so that's a very exciting proposition and we're always talking to people from overseas, flying people out to conferences. Um, it's just going to be fantastic that this will be, you know, the first port of call and then out, out at night to see, see it all live. Paddy Donovan, 20 years in the music industry this year. Apart from your family and uh, the music you make personally with your band, Cow's Muff, what's been the most satisfying per personal achievement through your work? Oh, I think, uh, I, think, I think the agent of change was, was something and a number of people were involved in that, but I think that was just so difficult and um, had so much sort of luck involved and the fact that now, you know, I'm quite regularly consulting, you know, governments in, you know, all over the world about it. I mean, I could 
almost just, <laughs> uh, you know, sell myself and just get on the world to, uh, uh, speaking circuit um, to know that that is actually going to protect all of our, you know, 500 venues from all of these developments going up and um, those developers, well, you know, suck it up. <laughs> It's great chatting to you. Thanks for being part of the Australian Music Vault. Patrick Donovan. Thanks, Jane.